exoplanet is a planet that orbits a star that's not our sun, okay, somewhere else in our galaxy. So far, astronomers have confirmed more than 5,000 exoplanets. Our next speaker discovered the first. And since then, his team has discovered about half of all the exoplanets we know. So please, give a warm Starmus Earth welcome to Michelle Mayor. Hello, everybody. Do we have other worlds in the universe? Do we have some living species in this other world? We are not the first one to discuss this kind of questions. Already more than 2,500 years ago, Greek philosophers were asking this kind of question. OK, the terminology is a terminology of other worlds. It was not exoplanet. This question focuses on planets only four or five hundred years ago. So I would like to discuss a little bit the change of paradigm concerning this question happening during the last century. You see here an atlas published in 1742 and already you can see that in the upper corner of this atlas that distant stars are surrounded with planetary system. And here this is a zoom of this region. And you see that already for the general public, it was quite admitted that we could have other planetary system in the universe. You have here also uh, the selling of the Clementinum in Prague uh, 10 years after. Also, you can see that uh, star, distant stars are surrounded with planetary system. And also, you can see that some orbits of comets. So this was quite admitted that we have as a planet, planetary system in the Milky Way. If we turn to the present time, here this is a Gaia view of our Milky Way. So it's a huge system. It's uh, 200 billion of stars. Our sun is only one among these 200 billion stars. And it's huge. The light will need something like 100,000 years to go from one side to the other one. So this is the system where we can expect maybe to search for planets. If we take a modern telescope and look in a very, very small region of the Milky Way, this is what you can see. So the problem is not to discover new stars. We have plenty of that. It's a problem to, to see if it's possible to detect planets orbiting this kind of distant stars. It's incredible. If a few centuries ago, people was already convinced that you have other planetary systems in the Milky Way you know, on other stars. In fact, during the beginning of the 20th century, you can see here a plot where you have the, the time and the estimation of the planetary system in the Milky Way. And the most famous astronomer of the time Sir Jeans uh, in Cambridge, Chaplet in Harvard, and so on, estimate that uh, we are alone in the Milky Way. Among 200 billion stars, we are alone, or maybe one or two others, not more. And you have a completely change of paradigm during the middle of the 20th century, and suddenly the ideas change completely, and the new estimation made from that time was billion and maybe hundreds of billion of planetary systems. 
And evidently this was due to the change of the hypothesis made to explain the formation of what is called the accretion disk, a disk of dust and gas orbiting around the, the star. We, at the time of the collapse of the matter to form new stars, you always have an excess of angular momentum to form this, this kind of, of accretion disk. But in the beginning of the 20th century, it was believed that the only way to form this kind of disk was the crossing of two stars at close distance, and the tidal interaction was needed to explain the formation of the disk. And we can easily calculate that the probability of such an event is zero. 200 billion stars, 10 billion years, no such col close collision. So this was the reason of the completely unusual and erroneous answer of the estimation of the number of planetary systems in the Milky Way. And after the 50s, in fact, it, people realized that it was only the formation of the disk was only a byproduct of the collapse of the gas. You have always excess of angular momentum, and this is the way to store the excess of angular momentum, forming a disk of dust and gas. So, uh, and I like very much, uh, it's, it's a very small paper published in 1952 by Otto Struve that he, he said it, it's not a, a scientific paper, it's just two, 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 yes, it's scientific, but it's only two pages without equation and so on. And it, this is for the first time that this uh, colleague did the good conclusion because he, he was measuring the rotation of solar type stars or smaller uh, mass stars. And he realized that all these stars were rotating very slowly on the, their axis. And where is the angular momentum? And he was the first to realize that this is the origin of the disk to form new planetary system. And he concluded correctly that therefore there can be many planet-like objects in the galaxy. And this changed completely the mind of, of astronomers at the time. And uh, many discoveries were made. First, in the infrared, people have detected this kind of disk, but also you have these beautiful uh, discoveries made by the Hubble Space Telescope in 1995. 1995, uh, 1990, uh, 1995. Uh, the Hubble Telescope, with its very high spatial resolution, look on some young stars just formed in the Orion Nebula. These young stars was emerging from the nebula and looking with the, with the space telescope, he was able to realize, to see, that all young stars were surrounded by a disk of dust, and it is dark here because the dust is blocking the light coming from behind from the nebula. So this was exactly a direct confirmation uh, of, the, of the proposal by Otto Struve. And the next question, if we are convinced that the number of planets is so huge, so it looks easy to say, OK, we can just look at the closest stars and, and see if we can detect planets. But it is not so easy, because the ratio of the luminosity between the star and the planet is huge. Just an, an example, in the solar system, if you have the sun producing the luminosity, Jupiter, the big planet, is reflecting part of this luminosity. It's only one part in one billion. So, at some distance, you are completely dominated by the luminosity of the star, and you cannot see the planet. So the direct imaging of, of planet, at least the closest one, is really challenging. So how we can detect? And we have to rely on indirect technique. And it's what we did uh, in the early 90s, said uh, if we, we have built with a French colleague a new spectrograph with the sensitivity large enough 
to detect extremely small change of the velocity of solar type stars. And if you have a star, the planet orbit like this. In fact, also the star will have a small wobble around the gravity center. So if you have a, a, a spectrograph with a sensitivity large enough to me measure this small change of the stellar velocity, you, will, you can induce sometimes that if you detect a change of the velocity, that something turn around. And this was already used for double stars, but evidently here you need a much higher precision because the ratio of the mass between the star head and the planet is much, much larger. So we start the program with the idea proposed at the time that the formation of a giant planet like Jupiter need to be formed with an orbit Large, at large distance of the stars to accumulate ice particles. So if it is at large, the period should be at least 10 years or more. So we start the measurement uh, uh, after the finalization of the construction of this spectrograph, and uh, we made a survey of more than 100 star solar type stars. Evidently, we do not have any a priori knowledge what is a good candidate. So you measure the, me the velocity. Another day, you remeasure the velocity. One week after, we remeasure the velocity, and so on. And after some time, you have a series of measurement. And most of the time, it's rather stable. Sometimes it's variable, but it's due to the magnetic activity of the star. But one of them was apparently with a periodic change of the velocity. OK. We are very happy to what we look. But the problem was that the period of this object was only 4.2 days. So this is a, disc a discrepancy of a factor of 1,000 compared to the prediction of the theory. So when you have a discrepancy of 1,000, you have to ask yourself if it's worthwhile to publish this. So we have decided to wait one year to remeasure the object to check if the period is the same, if the amplitude is the same, if the phase is the same, to be sure that it is not due to magnetic activity of the star. And after one year, we realized it is. So this was the discovery of this first object, very strange obje object about the mass of the mass of Jupiter, but with a completely crazy uh, period. And two days after, this was a rush by different, in different observatories and by different techniques. I will speak about the, the second technique after. In fact, by the Doppler effect, the change of the uh, frequency emitted by the star, about 1,000 was discovered, and the other was by the other technique. And today, we have more than 5,000 planets discovered is amongst stars not far from the sun. So just one example of what looks the discovery of one system. Here you have uh, the time is on the uh, axis. You have the velocity in, in vertically. And you see every small dot, red dot, correspond to one measurement made in one night of, uh, with a telescope. And you see you have this strong pattern of this. And in fact, if you analyze this with a computer, you can arrive immediately that you have three planets orbiting uh, the star. And this is uh, the first system with three planets with about 10 times the mass of uh, the, uh, the Earth. So it's three Uranus or Neptune type planet. OK, this is typically what looks uh, the discoveries. Sometimes it's much more complicated because I have in mind, for example, a system with seven planets with mass from the one, one Earth's mass to several Earth's uh, mass of Jupiter. And in fact, if you have one planet, it corresponds to five free parameters plus one. If you have seven planets, it's 36 free parameters. So I, I, you need a lot of measurement. It's uh, very difficult to find what is the solution. 
So, okay, now uh, we have the discovery of many very complex systems made by this technique. And in the same domain, but with a different instrument. Here, this is the uh, Alta, uh, Alta Plan Altiplano uh, north of Chile at 5,000 meters. And this was a new instrument implemented something like uh, 15 years ago. Uh, measuring with a 60 dish of 12 meters of diameter and with the capability to recombine the, measure, uh, the, uh, the electronic measurement made by, uh, simultaneously by all these dishes. And you have the possibility to, to change the, dispo uh, the, the, the disposal of these dishes to uh, have an interferometer and uh, to have a very, very high uh, angular resolution of object in the submillimeter domain. So the domain giving access to phenomena of low temperature, for example, formation of galaxies, formation of stars, formation of, of planets, and also all related matter, uh, interstellar matter. Beautiful instrument. And uh, evidently, if you look a small cloud of gas in the Milky Way with instrument, you can notice that if you use the, the, the picture is a normal picture, but we, when you use the interferometer, you arrive to this kind of picture you have here, where you see the formation of several planets taking all the matter in different ring. So this is uh, an image of the formation of a new multi-planetary system. So this is incredible that only two decades we have not seen any planet before, two, two three decades, and now we, do, we have the capability to analyze the site of the formation of the planetary system. And this is not restricted to one single object like this, but you see that all young, very young stars are surrounded, at, like seen at lower resolution by the Hubble Space Telescope. But you can see I mean, there is a detailed change from one star to another one. But all are surrounded by this kind of feature. And this confirms that, uh, a priori, we can estimate that every star, or almost every star, should have planetary system. After the discovery of 51 PEG, many, many other systems were discovered. And uh, we tried every, always to search if, by chance, you have the situation where you have a transit. So you have the star and the planet orbit. And if, by chance, the, pla the orbital plane is such that the, star, the planet will cross the disk between the, the line of sight to the telescope. In fact, you will have a small dip of the luminosity. And uh, we have discovered an object with a period of 3.5 days, so corresponding to the, a planet a little bit closer to the star. And uh, we collaborate with some colleague at Boulder. And with a very small telescope, 10 centimeters for amateur in a garage, but uh, exactly at the predicted time, you can notice the luminosity as a function of time. You have a drop of the luminosity by about 2%, a little bit less than 2%. Uh, my, my colleague repeat the measurement the following years with the Hubble Space Telescope with the advantage to be out of the atmosphere. And you see the quality of the measurement. It's absolutely, you have almost no noise so it's at this scale. And immediately you say, oh, if we have a such good precision, maybe we can have the capability to detect much, much smaller planets, for example, like the Earth. And uh, the second point, OK, you have two other nice consequences. One, that you have the possibility to determine the mean density the Doppler measurement for the give access to the mass, here to the size, so you can determine the mean density. And the mean density of the subject is only 0.3 gram per cubic centimeter. So 
this is half the mean density of Saturn. So this was a really the proof that the crazy object we had detected before was really gaseous giant planet. And the second consequence, this gave, okay, it was a huge stimulation to build new spacecraft to try to measure this from the space. And uh, you have different satellites. You have the, the French ESA satellite Coro, uh, having detected in f something like 50 planets, and the first rocky planet. But uh, evidently, the largest harvest was uh, coming from the Kepler space mission. It's about one, one meter diameter telescope. Apparently very simple. You have a, a big set of CCD to measure the luminosity of stars. You select a small piece of the sky with maybe 100,000 stars, so very dense field. And if this is the Earth, this is Kepler, it turns around like this, always measuring the same place of the Milky Way. And after a few years, taking one picture every, let's say, few minutes, you have a long series of measurement. And for some of them, you have a signal like this, like this, and so you have detected a new uh, transiting planet. But worse, or better, <laughs> in fact, for some of them, you have whoop, 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 Talk, talk, and so on. So you have multiple transit, and here you can notice in the plane where you have the radius in unit of Earth's radius versus period, you see some uh, dots have some colors, and for example, the red one corresponds to stars with six different planets orbiting the same object. So not only planets are frequent in the Milky Way, but multi-planetary systems are absolutely frequent. It's absolutely common, very common. And let's remember that in, we are only sensitive to system, uh, to, to system, planetary system with a good direction with the telescope. So all the system with the inclined or, uh, orbital plane, we will not have the same phenomena. So this is only the top of the, of the iceberg, tip over there. Evidently, this technique gives access only to the size of the planet, but not to the mass. And if we are interested to detect Earth's twin, and maybe with life, we need to do some chemical construction of the physics of this kind of object, and we need to measure the velocity to get the mass and to start to do physics. And the question behind this is to answer this question is, uh, is life a cosmic imperative? This is formula, form sentence was proposed by Christian de Duve, a Nobel Prize in biology. So he, he probably suggests that life is some kind of mandatory development of the evolution of the universe. You, you start forming plan, uh, particles, atom in the core of stars, for example, and after protein, oh no, uh, molecules, when the temperature is not too big, and then is life uh, some much more complex evolution, but uh, imperative in this way. We do not know the answer of that, but maybe we have the possibility to answer. But it's maybe not so easy. There is, is no, no possibility to go to send a spacecraft like so on the moon and to, to, to just look if you have some form of life. Here, this is a picture of the sun uh, with showing the complexity of the magnetic activity of the, star, uh, of the, of the sun, with spot, with magnetic field, eruption, and so on. So, the velocity of the, of the gas in the atmosphere of the sun is something like one kilometer per second. And you need to measure to 0.1 meter per second to detect Earth's twin. So 
when you, you, you try to measure the chain of the velocity of such an object, in fact, it's a measurement of the velocity of the stars or all the atom looking in the direction. But you are affected by all these phenomena. And in the domain of transit, there's a technique of the transit, the small dot in the middle of the square, of uh, the rectangle, is the size of the Earth at the same scale. So you need to see the very small drop of the luminosity due to the such a small body. So this is a real difficulty many colleagues are working on that presently. So if we succeed to do this kind of exercise, the goal will be to try to detect a set of molecules believed to be some kind of hints that, yes, life exists on, in the, on this object. It, it is called biomarker. So uh, some kind of, of change of the chemical composition of the atmosphere of this planet. And uh, this uh, kind of study was, was start, uh, started many years ago already from the ground. But I will just show a few more recent results obtained with the James Webb Telescope. And, uh, in working mostly in the infrared, evidently much above the Earth's atmosphere. So this is a very interesting plot, because this is obtained from the ground. It's not from, from the space, from the James Webb. You have the mass in log scale as a function of the period. This is a good example of the, what the discovery made by many teams during the last 20 years that the diversity of planetary system. You see that the, the mass and the period are absolutely carrying the full field of this uh, plane. So this explains the huge diversity observed of planetary system. Evidently, you see that the Earth, the Earth is, you have one year here, and you have one mass here. It corresponds to an empty part of the diagram because the sensitivity of the different techniques have quite difficulty to, to detect objects in this plane. So, okay, people are continuing, but nevertheless, already we can do some work here. I know. Okay, this, to explain the, the diversity, you have the normal Jupiter called cold Jupiter. You have this crazy object very close to the star, hot Jupiter, like 51 peg. You have Neptune type planet, very, very frequent, very frequent, and rocky planet, uh, a little bit with lower mass. You can notice some, some object with mass much, much less that the mass of the Earth have already been detected. So what is the idea? It's, uh, it's, 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 it's a very nice aspect of my domain. Some the ideas are very simple. Let's imagine, okay, you have a planet transiting in front of a star. So the contrast of the deep will is ex evidently a measure of the size of the planet. But if you measure, for example, we do the exercise with the Earth, let's say that the diameter of the Earth in the visible light is uh, 12,000 12, kilometers. You repeat the measurement, and so you have a deep. You repeat the measurement in the wavelength of the ozone at 9.7 micron infrared. Here, the ozone will block the luminosity at 40 kilometers. So the apparent size of the Earth in this wavelength is a little bit bigger, 12,000 kilometers plus 80. So the contrast of the deep is a measurement of the opacity of the atmosphere in a specific wavelength. So this is one way, very cheap way, 
to determine the spectroscopy of the atmosphere, the analyze the chemical composition of the atmosphere, simply analyzing the contrast of the transit in different wavelengths. And so after you can start to do some physics of the atmosphere of the atmosphere and maybe detect life biomarkers. Okay? You see, you change the wavelength, it's not so big. It's a very teeny, teeny, small fraction. And this is real measurement made by uh, the telescope, the James Webb telescope. And this is the same transit for different, different wavelengths. And if uh, the colleague having made this, analyze uh, the opacity as function of the wavelengths, this is the result. And you see that here, as a function of the wavelengths, the transit depth is changing. And you can notice, for example, this huge opacity peak here in, the, in, in pink is due to the carbon dioxide. But you have also carbon oxide, you have uh, sulfur oxide, you have water, evidently, and anapoly. We don't have, for, the, for this object, convincing evidence of methane. So this is a, the path to try to determine if life exists on some rocky planet. For the moment, the, the, the depth of the, of, of the an Earth screen is too small, probably, to achieve the detection of this kind of phenomena for a real Earth twin. Because, OK, you need a lot of photons. You have two big numbers, because the, the, the effect of the star, the effect when the, the planet is in front or behind, and you have a small change, a small difference between two. So you need a lot, a lot of photons to do it, a, a big telescope, or see. But already you have, they have achieved a certain uh, some result for that. And if you need to have a big number of photons, what you need to build is to build big telescopes. And this is a beautiful project uh, right now in development in north of Chile. This is a telescope of 39 meters of diameter. It's not the, same as the size of the, of the enclosure is the size of the mirror. So I don't know exactly, but it's something like the, this, 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 this room here. It's absolute, uh, the mirror, the main mirror is something just as seen, as big as this place here. And this was one year ago, but already today the, the enclosure is almost clo closed. And it is expected, no, I will not, it is expected to, be, to have the first light in 2028, so only a few years from now. So it's not uh, something long term and so on. So evidently, this, will, this huge instrument will not devo be devoted only for exoplanet, but evidently for cosmology and stellar physics and thi things. Like this. So, Absolutely fantastic progress are expected from this beautiful instrument. And I will finish with uh, something quite dif dif different. Uh, it's a little bit complementary to what was said before by uh, Martin Rees. Uh, 50 some years ago, Apollo 11 went to the moon, three days of travel. Light need only one second to go. So let's imagine that in a different survey, we will discover a perfect Earth twin. So a twin with, uh, let's say, at 30 light years from here. So a neighbor at the size of the galaxy is really a neighbor. So what 30 years is already one billion seconds. So it is one billion times further than the moon. So for the, pres for, for the existing possibility of the physics, I don't see any possibility to go. 
because, okay, you can take the time, but if you want to go in a reasonable time, you need to accelerate. And to accelerate, you need a huge amount of energy, and then after to, dis to, to decelerate. And in any case, it will be millions of years for to do this. So we do not have, you have the possibility maybe to detect some form of life, uh, change of the chemical composition in the atmosphere in exoplanet, but we will not go to this planet. And if somebody exists if some, uh, on this planet, they have exactly the same problem. They will not come to visit us. So really, we do not have any planet B. We are human. We are really linked to this planet. And I believe it's safe to, con to try to protect it. So thank you. <laughs>